This is Stuart Revit speaking from Kingsway Church, Wombourne. Thank you for joining me for a meditation on Remembrance Day. It was at the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month that the guns fell silent on the Western Front, bringing to an end World War I, the Great War, which ended 102 years ago today. We're all familiar with the sepia tone photographs of men in uniform posing before going off to war, of photos of smiling Tommies leaving for France, or marching to the front, or climbing out of their trenches. A few weeks into the war on the 23rd of August 1914, a great wave of grey-clad German troops crashed into the contemptible little army, as the Kaiser of Germany called the British Army. Although outnumbered three to one, the British held the line until sheer weight of numbers and the retreat of the French on their right flank caused them to fall back. So followed a rapid retreat by the British, day after day fleeing from the German army until something remarkable happened. The exhausted British were on the point of annihilation when they reached the Marne River. It was here that the legend of the Angel of Mons originated. It was said that angels appeared between the two armies and held the Germans back so that the exhausted Tommies could regroup. Did this really happen as the story tells it? I don't know. But it could have. In the Bible there's a story of the prophet Elisha who was in a city that was surrounded by his enemies. Early that morning his servant goes onto the city walls and he sees this mighty army surrounding the city. He runs to his master Elisha and he does an impersonation of Corporal Jones from Dad's army. Don't panic, don't panic, we're surrounded, don't panic. Elisha, remaining calm, prays, Lord, open his eyes. And when the servant looks again, he sees the host of heaven protecting the city. Whatever the truth, the Germans were held and there was then virtually stalemate for almost four years, four years of trench warfare. Various large battles were fought with little results. One such battle was the infamous Battle of the Somme, commencing on the 1st of July 1916, when the British took 60,000 casualties in one day. On Monday the 13th of November 1916, the Allied commanders decided that they would make one more attack upon the German lines before the winter snows made any other offensive impossible. So, after moving up during the night to a position just outside Serre, a small hamlet in the Somme region of France, the men of the 2nd Battalion South Staff's Regiment went over the top. After a promising start, a counter-attack cut across their lines and casualties were heavy, one of whom was Private 19134 Herbert Revit, who was never heard of again. He became one of the missing of the Somme, whose name, along with 72,000 others, is on the Teepval Memorial. It was my grandfather. Locally, a man from Treasel, a man named George Baker, was also killed on that day. Also, sometime during the four years of war, another private, this time of the Bedfordshire Regiment, was wounded and returned home. He died of his wounds on the 6th of July 1920, six months after the birth of his only daughter, my mother. So this is a very personal message this morning. The flower of British youth was wiped out on the fields of France. My family was of course not alone in its sacrifice. Virtually every city, town or village in Britain has some sort of memorial to those who paid the ultimate sacrifice in World War I. Whenever I look at one of these memorials, I'm always struck by the number of times the same surname appears, often two, three times. There are 40 names on the memorial in Wamburn, including three pairs of brothers. Interestingly, two of the only villages in England that did not lose anyone in the war were the slaughters in the Cotswolds. 
Today we're commemorating the bravery, the self-sacrifice of the men and women who gave their lives, and in many cases their health, to fight for their country in both World War I and the many conflicts that have taken place since. But of course it's not just in times of war that men and women are willing to sacrifice their lives for the good of others. Many people throughout the ages have lived sacrificial lives and have paid the ultimate price to help others. People who spend their lives in serving others. We've had that this year with the doctors and the nurses and the care workers and those who serve us in the shops. Have you ever wondered why they do this? Why are so many willing to give their lives for complete strangers? What is it within us that given the right circumstances we would lay down our lives to help others? Why did so many men continue to join up to fight in the trenches even though they knew the horrors that would face them? To understand this we need to go back to the creation of the world. God made the heavens and the earth and everything on it and he said it was good. God created mankind in his own image and he put his own nature into us, the people he created and he said that this was very good. God is a God of love, compassion, justice, righteousness, faithfulness, a good God who loves the people he created and he put these attributes into the hearts of men and women. So what went wrong? Why are there so many atrocities happening on a daily basis around the world? Why are we remembering today a world war that caused the death of 16 million of the people that God created and another 21 million wounded? Because Adam and Eve, the couple made in the image of God, chose to disobey their Heavenly Father and sin entered the world. This sin as polluted creation, and the results are only too evident all around us today. Today we have conflicts in other parts of the world, and it's not just war. There are horrors happening all around us. Child abuse, violent crime, too much to mention. And it has been the same throughout the ages. This didn't take God by surprise. He doesn't look down from heaven and say to his angels, Oh, now look what they're up to. I never expected that. The Bible tells us that Jesus Christ was a sacrificial lamb who was slain before the foundation of the world. The only way to break this cycle of sin was for someone born from the line of Adam, the first man, yet not tainted by sin, to give themselves as a sin offering. 43 million Gospels of St John were handed out in training camps, at train stations, at hospitals and on the front lines during World War I. They were made small to fit into the front pocket of a soldier or sailor shirt. These Gospels brought hope to the men fighting for their country. They told the story of a God who came to earth, the earth that he created. A God who was willing to lay down his life to break the power of sin. Included in these little books are these words. My command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this. To lay down one's life for one's friends. Greater love has no one than this. To lay down one's life for one's friends. These words and others in these little books brought hope and comfort to the men who were risking their lives. One soldier wrote, When your small testaments were distributed on the common at Southampton, I little dreamed that I should use it and find in it great consolation in the lonely hours. When at night I have been on duty alone with him by my side and the Germans but 30 yards away, I realised that I needed more than my own courage to stand the strain. When the shells burst at my feet, I have marvelled at the fact of still being alive. I heard the story of one soldier who every day read the words of Psalm 91. 
Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely He will save you from the foulest snare and from the deadly pestilence. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right side, but it will not come near you. This man went through the horror of the psalm, where literally that came true. Many fell at his side, but he survived. On another occasion, he came face to face with a German soldier who was pointing a rifle at him and attempted to shoot, but his rifle jammed. Why was he saved? And many others perished, I don't know. I just know that he trusted in God for his deliverance. The soldiers in the trenches could relate to the story of Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane as he prayed, Father, is there no other way? Yet not my will, but yours be done. They could believe in a saviour who shed drops of blood as he prayed on the night before his execution. Many soldiers also shed drops of blood on the night before they went over the top as the immense mental strain under that strain, blood vessels burst and they literally sweated blood. They too wished that there was some other way, but they know that they had to do. They had to do their duty. They knew that God understood how they felt as they waited for the wrath of the German army to be poured out upon them. They knew that God understood how they felt because on the cross, Jesus experienced the wrath of a loving God that hates sin so much that he was willing to pour out upon his son the punishment for sin so that the power of sin could be broken and we could be forgiven. They could relate to someone who, although he was and is God, became a man and who put himself through that. They knew that this Jesus was no plaster saint that this God was not a far-off deity who could not feel pain. This is a God who knew what it was like to feel pain, terror, loneliness, but was still willing to do his duty, to save the world from itself. Did the soldiers and sailors and airmen of World War I, who gave their lives for their king and country, achieve anything by their sacrifice? Or did they die in vain? I would like to believe that their sacrifices made a difference. But if I'm honest, I'm not sure. As of course there was another war 20 years later. So I'm not sure of this. But my friends, I am sure that there is another king from another country who did not die in vain. A king who by his death brought life and freedom to all who believe. Some words of an old hymn. I vow to thee, my country, all earthly things above, entire and whole and perfect, the service of my love. The love that asks no questions, the love that stands the test, that lays upon the altar the dearest and the best. The love that never falters, the love that pays the price, the love that makes undaunted the final sacrifice. And listen to this last verse. And there's another country I've heard of long ago. Most dear to them that love her. Most great to them I know. On the cross, Jesus defeated a foe much worse than the Kaiser's army. He defeated sin and death. The Bible says that he triumphed over them and led them into captivity. Perhaps the soldiers in the wars... That perhaps their faith in a God like that helped them to climb out of trenches into a hail of bullets. Perhaps they had a glimpse of eternity through their faith. I can believe in a God like that. What about you? What about you? Can you believe in a God of love who came down to pay the price of sin? To quote again from St John's Gospel. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. We have a God 
who was willing to send his son, the son that he loves, into the world that he created, that this world might be saved. We have a saviour who was willing to be nailed to a wooden cross to suffer shame and pain so that the world that was going its own way, that a people who were just like sheep were following one another to destruction can have a way out. At 11 o'clock on the 11th of the 11th, we remember the moment in 1918 when the guns fell silent. We remember the sacrifice made by men and women who gave their lives for their country. And we give thanks for the ultimate victory that they had over their enemies at Easter each year. We remember a God who gave his life for everyone in every country who is willing to trust him with their lives. We celebrate a God who on the cross won a great victory over sin and death. And we give thanks that through the death of Jesus, sin and death have been destroyed. Before I finish, I just want to put a couple of questions to you this morning. The first question is this, is there anyone today who doesn't know Jesus Christ as their saviour? The prophet Isaiah wrote, We all like sheep have gone astray, each one to our own way. But then he continues, But the Lord has laid on him, that's Jesus, the sin of us all. Jesus fulfilled this prophecy. On the cross, by his death, he took the punishment for sin, your sin, my sin. This set us free from the power of sin if we put our trust in him. Also, he didn't stay dead. On the third day, he rose from the dead and broke the power of sin over the people he created. Oh, these bodies may wear out, but those who have put the trust in Jesus will never die. Their spirits will live with him forever. We repeat, each Remembrance Sunday, that the words of that poem, they shall not grow old as we who are left grow old. Well, Jesus will never grow old, not because he's dead, but because he's alive forevermore. So what about you today? You've heard about the soldiers in World War I receiving peace in the middle of the horrors of the battlefield. Will you receive the peace, the reassurance that only Christ can bring? Will you receive the greater love of God in your hearts? At the back of those little gospels that were given out, to the soldiers and sailors there was a prayer if you'd like to want that assurance of knowing Christ as your saviour the same assurance that they had of knowing Christ as their saviour if you want that same assurance that knowledge that Christ died for you and that because he lives you too can have both eternal life and fullness of life now then will you join me in saying these words you don't have to say them out loud you can just repeat them in your heart, these were the words of the prayer. Being convinced that I am a sinner and believing that Christ died for me, I now receive him as my saviour. And with his help, I intend to confess that faith before all people. Amen. I'd like to give another challenge. Are we ready to live sacrificially? Are we willing to pour our lives out for others? We've heard about the sacrifices of those who served their king and country in World War I. Are we willing to serve our king to extend his country? God has put something of eternity into the hearts of all of us. That same willingness that was shown so completely by Christ on the cross to die for others is at work in us today. It is at work in those who spend their time helping others for no or little earthly reward because they call, they're called by God to do so. So how much are we willing to give? Oh, it, it, it probably won't lead to our deaths, but it may call for a sacrifice of time, energy, money. All of us who seek to follow Christ are called to seek first the kingdom of God, to light candles in the darkness of this world, to be willing to sacrifice for the one who gave his life for us. We call to be willing 
to give our lives in service to others, not in such a dramatic way as the soldiers of World War I, but being willing to put others first. People helping people who will never be able to repay us. These are all acts of sacrifice. What stops us from stepping out and taking risk and making a sacrifice for others? How much are we willing to give, to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness? Are we willing to pour out his love on the people of our communities? Please join me in a short prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for those who sacrifice their lives that we might live. We thank you, God, for your sacrifice, that you gave your life on a cross for us. Lord, help us to serve others as a sacrifice to you. Thank you, Lord. Amen. <laughs>